Well, we get the honor of doing this from the other side of the resurrection. Christ having died, went to the grave, comes out of the grave, ascends into heaven, descends into our hearts. That's a part that often gets missed when people start talking about the incarnation of Christ and the advent, is they almost always stop with the ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father. Well, what does that mean? That's not some big throne room somewhere where Jesus right now is literally, and I'm going to break someone's theology, this big room where Jesus right now is sitting on a throne and God's at his left hand and Jesus is at God's right and they look at one another and wink and smile when you come up and pray. And they're always having a massive courtroom battle and, and between this devil who's running in and out to and fro and, and Jesus is defending you in front of the Father because of the blood. These are just metaphors. It doesn't mean there's a big throne room somewhere on a planet on the other side of Saturn where Jesus is interceding on your behalf. It means that he's the king equal with the Father. And so I believe firmly that Christ is alive inside of us. This was the mystery that had been shut up from the ages, but was revealed, Paul said in Colossians, through the Gentiles, that Christ could live in a man and that Christ was the hope of glory. Now that doesn't even seem like a mystery to us. It shouldn't. We're 2,000 years on the other side of Pentecost, where Christ lives in us. But for the early church, it was a mystery that Christ could live in men. Because Christ means the anointed one. He's a figure. He's a person. They were waiting for him and they believed they had found him in a man named Jesus. Anointed beyond measure. And so for them, Christ, wrapped up in a man named Jesus, had come. So to say Christ could be in you, well, that's mind-blowing. That means that the same Jesus they saw with their eyes and they touched in the flesh disappeared moved from one dimension into the other, shed his body so that his soul, spirit, this is mind-blowing, so that his spirit could return at Pentecost and live inside of you. Now, that's that's probably a baseline argument uh, in moving forward, especially in how we read the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is full of and I like how Mark opened yesterday talking about good advice and good news. The Old Testament's really full of good advice. It's pretty good advice. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't lust after your neighbor's stuff. Don't murder. Good advice. It's not all good news. None of it transforms you. How many of you know if you don't steal, it doesn't make you a new creation because you didn't steal? That's the whole point. The law can't transform you. However, how many of you know that good news preceding good advice can make the good advice even better? For instance, if you hand $5 to your kid and say, hey, here's five bucks in the toy section, don't spend it all in one place, that's good advice. In today's economy, it's pretty tough advice, (laughs) right? And uh, so good advice is still pretty much ignored and pretty much irrelevant. But don't spend it all in one place is good advice if you just won the lottery, $500 million, don't spend it all in one place. Good advice. Feels even better after good news, doesn't it? (laughs) And I think that's what happens with even with the law, with, with the performance standards of the law. Take away the performance to be and put in the performance out of, and the good advice on the other side of good news, Christ lives in you the hope of glory, the good advice starts to mean something. Good advice, don't lie. Well, I'm a new creation. It would be a bad thing to lie. I would create some chaos in my life I don't want to have to deal with. Good advice on the backside of good news, awesome thing. So we get to filter through the good advice of the Old Testament. And how many of you know there are a lot of time-stamped things in the Old Testament that aren't yours? Time-stamped meaning they're going to happen. They're going to happen soon. They're going to happen someday. Stop looking for them. Okay, so when Isaiah tells you, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. You don't need to start the church of looking for the virgin to conceive. She's already conceived. That prophecy isn't for you. Now you can celebrate it because you see Jesus in it, right? But it's a time stamp prophecy. It actually has happened. It doesn't need to happen again. There's no dual fulfillment. God's not looking to do this twice. The virgin has conceived, brought forth the son. Praise God, that's it. So you can read some things in the Old Testament and realize that they are time-bound, time-stamped, even covenant-stamped promises, things that are going to happen inside the confines of an Old Covenant. And there are other things that transcend the Old Testament. Man, they are farther and broader and brighter and they shoot higher than anything the Old Testament had to offer, and they're completely out of place. David sends with Bathsheba and says to God in Psalms 51, 
if you wanted sacrifices, I would give them. But you don't want sacrifices. You want a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And David did not have any scripture behind that prayer. There wasn't a single verse in the old Torah, in the, in the Pentateuch, that said, God doesn't want your sacrifice. God wants your contrite heart. And yet David is praying beyond his own covenant. He's shooting forward. <laughs> he's grabbing a Jesus from another covenant, and he's praying it into his timeline. You get to see that because you're on the other side of the resurrection. David couldn't have seen that. How, did he, how in the world did he see that? That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit alive within these, sprinkled within these pages of the Old Testament. And you get the glory of going back and finding some of those.